Welcome to LFPL's At the Library series, an ongoing podcast featuring author talks, programs, and events at the Louisville Free Public Library. For more information about upcoming events, visit us online at www.lfpl.org forward slash upcoming events dot htm. Welcome. Everyone, um, so I'm very pleased to introduce our um, our teacher for the next four weeks. This is Dr. Calvin Coker. He's an assistant professor in the Department of Communication at the University of Louisville. He teaches courses in argumentation, political communication, and identity. He received his PhD in communication from the University of Missouri in 2018, and his area of specialty is the intersection of public policy, communication, and marginality. So please, if you would, welcome Dr. Calvin Coker. Thank you. So first, thank you all for coming out this evening. I know that it is wet and cold, uh, and I really appreciate you all being here. With introductions out of the way, I will go ahead and just kind of get you to structure. Let's get a sense of what four weeks actually looks like. It looks, I think, something like this. Tonight, we're going to talk a little bit about how we got to this current kind of sociopolitical moment uh, and why it perhaps feels as though argument maybe takes on a weight or a negative valence. Uh, some people in here may really enjoy argument. This is understandable, right? Competitive debate is a thing that we sometimes force, but very often just encourage high school students, college students uh, to do. We also know that folks tend to engage in arguments throughout their lives. It's something that matters a great deal, interpersonally, within the workforce, all manner of different things. Uh, but that doesn't mean that it is easy. And as we enter an election year, we know that it is particularly difficult because there are moments in which the arguments that we are making, they tend to alienate. They tend to create tension and friction, and not productive friction, not the kind of friction that you hope argument would create. Uh, I always tell my students that you can pick whatever force-based metaphor you want. It could be, I don't know, uh, coal being forged into diamond under pressure. It could be a whetstone against a sword. Essentially, we're talking about friction or pressure, but that actually yields a better, more refined product. In an ideal world, that's what argument is. So part of this class is figuring out why it's so hard to get to that point. That's what we're doing tonight. We're talking a little bit about political polarization and how that has led to a sociopolitical moment where argument is something that a lot of us shy away from. Not necessarily because of lack of skill, not necessarily because of lack of interest, but because frankly, sometimes it feels as though the cost of argument kind of outweighs the benefits in some ways. Then next week, we're going to talk about good faith argument. Good faith is a legal term normally that refers to contracts, but for the purposes of this class, we're thinking about good faith as essentially an argument in which you are a willing, consenting, thoughtful partner, and that particular segment of this course will be about how to maybe navigate other people around you into that space, while also giving you a sense of when to pull the ripcord if somebody is very much engaging in bad faith. We'll then uh, have a conversation on January 23rd about how we should treat emotion in arguments. I'll give you a spoiler. Emotion and rationality are not opposed. I would argue that a vast majority of emotions are rational. If somebody stomps on my foot and I'm angry, that's a rational response, right? Now, normally when people say someone is being too emotional, what they mean is either some version of a gendered nonsensical critique, or your response is disproportionate. Your emotions are disproportionate to this event. I have a four-year-old daughter, so I am very familiar with disproportionate emotions. <laughs> Toddlers, they are feeling all of their feelings. An argument could be made that that makes argument harder, but that doesn't mean that emotion has no place in argument. And then we will finally end with a conversation on structures of power and specifically those sort of embedded societal elements that create context for argumentative encounters and also can at times make arguments significantly harder for some people while making argument, I hesitate to call it easier, uh, but perhaps less restrictive 
for others. That's really the framework. That's the direction that we're going to go. I would love to have you all in all four courses, but there will be uh, not like sufficient callbacks or anything that would force you into a situation where you would need to see session two in order to like understand session three, right? So if there is conflict uh, and you're unable to get here on a Tuesday night, you can still come to the other three, and I would love to have you. I'd also love to have you for all four. Uh, just some quick housekeeping notes, some logistics to maybe structure your expectations. There's not going to be readings. I'm more than happy to provide you the evidence that we talk about here. I'm more than happy to follow up with anyone who uh, sends me an email. But I'm not going to be providing you a whole rack of readings or handouts or like external assignments or something along those lines. Uh, you are more than welcome to take notes. I'm not going to perceive it as rude if you're sort of ticking away at your phone. Uh, that frankly, is the way that a lot of us take notes anymore. Um, I will also say that you should not hesitate to interrupt me with a question if you feel like it is germane to what we're talking about. I just may ask you to wait for half a second while we finish a thought and then deal with the question. I will try my hardest to actually leave about 15 minutes at the end also for some general questions if something inspires you at that time. Uh, but let's not rely on that uh, because sometimes my time management is mediocre and that's the way that it works. Uh, and finally, Finally, if you are curious about something, if something uh, sort of jogs your memory and makes you think, hey, I actually would like to learn more about that, you're welcome to send me an email. It's my name, calvin.coker at louisville.edu. Uh, I respond to it relatively frequently, and I will not leave you in the wind. So I would sort of posit to you all that argument is not really something that we need to shy away from, but very often the way that we conceive of argument is as something negative. And to kind of demonstrate that, I'm very curious. This will be the only segment of audience participation tonight, I promise. Uh, does anyone have on tap, what was the last argument you had? And do you know if you want it? <laughs> yeah. I had an argument with my sister over private prison. Okay. And I would say it was a productive argument because I changed my opinion. Oh, okay. So it's not necessarily that you won. It's instead that, like, you were better as a consequence of the encounter. Is that accurate? Yeah. Okay. That makes sense. Others? Yeah. This is almost reading to the end of the page, and I appreciate that. Because we do sometimes consider arguments with winners and losers. And sometimes that's valid insofar as if you're having a disagreement with your spouse about where you should be eating dinner or something like that, you say, I would like to go out to a Chinese restaurant, and they say, have you considered a Mexican restaurant? And then they're unable to be shaken off of that, and you end up going to El Nopal. Somebody won that argument, in a sense, right? Because at the end of the day, when you look at the scoreboard, something has changed. That argument affected something in the world. Now, it's possible that going to El Nopal was a foregone conclusion. Like, it's within the realm of possibility that that argument actually wasn't going to influence anything. When we think about arguments in terms of winners and losers, we are doing ourselves a disservice. Because we imagine that the only way to win an argument is to collect a pound of flesh. Or something, some variation on it, if you prefer a less, I guess, vivid or violent metaphor. This conversation about, well, I came away better. I learned something. That, arguably, is what argument is capable of. That is something that we should all aspire to. But very often, when we consider the last argument that we had, we actually are probably thinking about an interpersonal squabble of some kind. It's also possible that some of you are thinking about a conversation which you had on one of the various social media platforms. Somebody posted something on Facebook, you got into the comments, an hour and a half later, nobody is happy. Uh, and that you almost don't know what to do with it. Maybe you feel like you won because you made better points or you got more likes or some sort of external measure of, 
I guess, like validation for your position or your argument. But at the bottom, I don't want you to imagine argument and think about argument as these small interpersonal moments where there's just like a back and forth. There's not really like an attempt to change minds. It's more just, I have a preference. I have a preference. Let us battle our preferences. That's, that's really not the argument that I think we should be having. And this class is very much about navigating towards what I would characterize as productive argument. And that has, I would suggest, a series of criteria. So productive argument, in my opinion, features, first, the consent of those who are participating. That's the base level, right? I don't know if you've ever tried to have an argument with someone who actively does not want to have this argument, and they cannot be forced into engaging, but you're, you're spinning your wheels. Nobody is happy by the end of that, and there's no adequate resolution. It's more than possible that that argument matters a great deal. You actually do need to have this conversation with this person, and yet there is a reticence or a lack of willingness to engage. That fundamentally precludes productive argument. But it's not just that every conversation partner, every participant has to consent. There have to be other criteria to determine that this argument actually has the potential to truly lead to something that both parties would view in, I hesitate to call it a positive light, but an acceptable light. We have to, for example, be assured that every party has to have buy-in to the eventual resolution of the object of disagreement, even if that resolution does not feature compromise. There are some moments in which compromise is not really possible. I think that in American politics, which is very, very polarized, and we will talk way more about that, there is this presumption that if we all meet in the middle, we're going to be in a better place. On some issues, that may very well be true. But on others, that's actually a false flag. What does compromise with white supremacists look like? Tiki torches on the weekends? Like that, That's not something that we can do. And as such, in order to have an argument about white supremacy, there has to be buy-in from the people who perhaps have white supremacist ideologies or tendencies to accept that that particular ideology is damaging and probably ought to be excluded from their calculus. I would argue that productive argument requires us all to be vulnerable in that way because we have to be prepared to be profoundly and exceedingly wrong. And that notion of being incredibly wrong, that's actually a place where a lot of arguments are not going to be productive because nobody wants to be wrong. But in that vein, we have to have that willingness to change our minds. There are things that we all feel very, very deeply about. And they could be informed by any number of things. Our religious upbringing, our uh, general like familial stances. We also maybe have had life experiences that inform the nature of our positions. And there are things that, I guess in my mind, I realistically could not be shaken off of. That being said, I think that there are fewer of those kinds of things than we'd like to believe. There are very often moments in which we actually could be adopting or adjusting alterations to our positions, not because somebody is forcing us to, not because that's like the socially palatable thing to do, but because genuinely that actually reflects learning. It reflects an adjustment of our position. I had a fair amount of information. I came to a conclusion. I got new information. So I reached a new conclusion. I updated my conclusion. Productive argument, I would say, features that willingness. It also features a minimization of argument tactics which are designed to end the argument but not solve a problem. We've all been there, these moments where we're having an argument and suddenly the argument is about something else. It's about something very, very different. If it's an interpersonal thing, it's something that you did six months ago, six years ago, when you were a child, these kinds of things. Or perhaps you're engaging with someone who acts like a pigeon playing chess, meaning that rather than engage the rules of the game, they flip the board over and defecate all over it. That notion, that's not productive argument. It can't be, right? Because somebody is actively investing, er, actively invested in subverting what is going on. That subversion, and this is a preview of next week, I would say constitutes bad faith argument because there are some folks who want to engage 
They want to engage you. But that engagement is not actually about reaching a resolution. I don't know if anybody's familiar with uh, the meme of the gentleman sitting at a table with a controversial opinion and then the phrase debate me underneath it. So it's a good meme format. That person is Steven Crowder. Uh, and Crowder is, among other things, uh, an individual who is actively invested in cultivating outrage. His whole shtick is having a controversial position, baiting other people into debating him, having it on film, and then that outrage, that altercation, that becomes the thing. That's the reason that he was doing it, because it's a form of content. Sometimes when we talk about argument, we're actually talking about outrage, and there, there's something to be said about how outrage can sell. But according to this, outrage may not actually be productive. It may not be getting us to that point of productive argument that otherwise we would view as very desirable, very worthwhile. And as such, tonight is really animated by the following question. How does our current sociopolitical moment, how do these broader societal structural forces actually make productive argument less likely? And how does it make argument significantly harder on us? I'm not going to... We're not going to focus entirely on like the macro level for this four weeks, right? Like there are practical elements of this that you can be using in your everyday life. And much of this applies to interpersonal argument. However, we would be starting on the wrong foot if we didn't acknowledge that there's a whole bunch that has happened socially and politically, which makes interpersonal argument significantly harder. And we're going to talk about three of those things tonight affective polarization, ideological polarization, and conspiracy theories. I'm not going to talk about conspiracy theories as like, look at all these conspiracy theories, aren't they fun? Uh, because some of them, uh, this is an aside, some of them are kind of fun. Uh, the notion that birds are actually government surveillance drones and COVID-19 was a way to just change their batteries, I find that very amusing. Uh, now, I'm not trying to insult you if you do believe that birds are surveillance drones. But I do think that that's a very hard argument to have, which is the reason that I mention it tonight. But I get ahead of myself. First, affective polarization. We're going to talk a little bit about uh, what it is, how we got here, and also why specifically affective polarization matters for argument. Um, when, when media pundits, when journalists, when politicians talk about America is more polarized than ever, there's a lot that they mean there. Because there are a lot of different ways to measure polarization. When we talk about polarization at a base level, we're talking about the distance between poles. Meaning that on whatever measure, somebody may be way over here and somebody may be way over here. Whereas uh, a more like middle of the road or moderate or less polarized version would have people over here. By example, in my household, my wife despises onions. So much so that I am banned from making French onion soup. Like, it is, it is non-negotiable for her. I, on the other hand, really enjoy onions. I think that they generally promote a preferable sandwich. It's a very nice thing. We are pretty polarized. If we were both like closer to each other. Maybe I had opinions about onions, kind of a take them or leave them, and she maybe had like a generally negative view towards them, but again, take them or leave them. That's not polarized right there. Yeah, there's difference, right? But we're still pretty close to each other at the end of the day. But it, an avowed hater of onions and me, an onion lover, that's a pretty polarized household. So when we talk about affective polarization in the context of politics, we're actually talking about the distance in feeling between political parties. A number of scholars, uh, chief amongst them, Shanto Iyengar out of Stanford, makes the argument that, yes, Americans are increasingly polarized. There's a whole bunch of different ways that we can measure it and a whole bunch of different ways that we can think about it. But the one that is perhaps the most troubling is that Americans of different political stripes increasingly do not like each other. That sounds very basic, right? But the way that this is actually measured is social scientists use what's called a feeling thermometer. They ask survey, response or, uh, survey participants to rate on a scale of zero to 100 how warmly do you feel towards 
insert a politician, insert a political party, whatever it happens to be. And what they have found over and over and over again is that increasingly the red team really likes the red team, really likes politicians that are associated with the red team, really likes anything that appears to be associated with the red team, and dislikes the blue team and blue team politicians and anything that's remotely uh, associated with the blue team. The converse is also true. There are debates about the nature of that polarization. There are debates about what it can actually lead to. I'm not going to bore you with those details. But suffice to say, folks like Druckmann and Levy make the argument that there is a significant gap between individuals' positive feelings towards their own political party and negative feelings towards the opposing party. Uh, an example, a relatively contemporary one, Self-identified liberal Democrats approved of Joe Biden actually more than moderate Democrats. 66% uh, approval rating for Biden compared to 57% for moderate Democrats. When you jump down to Republicans, though, 77% of self-identified Republicans strongly disapprove of Biden. 84% versus 64% conservative versus moderate. This doesn't just mean that there are, like, a couple fewer Republicans who dislike Biden or who disapprove of Biden. And it also doesn't mean that the feelings are generally mixed among the Democratic Party. Democrats are pretty concentrated on one side in terms of approving of Joe Biden, whereas Republicans are pretty unified in their disapproval of Biden. There are a number of different explanations that we could try to suss out, but affective polarization would suggest Democrats like Biden because they're his guy. And Republicans don't like Biden because he's not their guy. And it's not just that he's not their guy. It's that he is the person res like directly responsible for deposing their guy, in a sense. This seems like a rudimentary, very, very simplistic vision of politics, right? It feels, I hesitate to... I hesitate to call it sectarian, but it's like it's a very, very heavily divided thing when we think about it in this way. Now, the reason that this matters so much is that that public opinion, it does measure something, but it doesn't measure necessarily the effectiveness of the Biden administration. I would argue that the problem with things like affective polarization is that they give us a kind of false flag or a false cue because we're essentially putting partisan identity ahead of other things. I don't really mind or care how you feel about the Biden administration. It's possible that you disagree. It's possible that you will vote an entirely different direction in 2024. It's possible that you disagree fundamentally with the nature of the 2020 election. However, if those disagreements are primarily motivated by affective polarization, we have a little bit of a problem, right? Because you can disagree with a government official. You can disagree with a policy. And if your disagreement is couched in terms of substance, in terms of why a particular policy, why a particular uh, enactment of a thing is damaging, all right, we can go somewhere with that, right? Like, that's how policy debates actually normally get enacted. We talk about legislation, we think about its hypothetical implementation, we adjust, we tweak, and then eventually something gets implemented. Something that is almost certainly imperfect in a lot of different ways, but it maybe reflects the argumentative process that led to it. But affective polarization makes it so that sometimes policy, politicians, the substance of what it is doesn't matter. The fact that it's a member of the team is the thing that matters. I'm thinking of the Affordable Care Act, where love it or hate it as a piece of legislation, it essentially resembled pieces of legislation that were advocated by conservative think tanks like the Heritage Foundation in the 1990s. The prevailing thought in the Obama administration was that if we were to immediately begin at the middle in terms of universal health care or some variation on it, we would be able to reach across partisan lines because, logically, these folks preferred these policies a scant 10 years prior. That doesn't account for affective polarization. It doesn't account for the fact that there were simply no Republican votes for the Affordable Care Act. Now, it's more than possible that all of those individual folks had justifiable, entirely reasonable objections to the Affordable Care Act. In the same way that individuals who disapprove of Biden now almost certainly have justifiable, understandable reasons. 
But at the bottom, if something is animating our selection of those reasons, and it has to do with our dislike of the out group or our love of the in group, we're actually creating a problem for ourselves. Because how do you convince someone to give up their in group? And if you're a member of the out group, how do you convince them that you are not a threat? That you are not the problem that other media sources perhaps have constructed you to be. Now, this may not be the way that you think about politics. And that's entirely understandable. As a matter of fact, I would encourage you not to think about politics in this way. But there has been a drumbeat in the last 30 years that has encouraged more and more segments of the American population to actually think about politics in this red team, blue team, winners and losers kind of question. A couple of reasons why we are here. These are not exhaustive, but they are worth talking about. First, outrage journalism and political punditry. I don't know how you feel about Rush Limbaugh. I don't know if you grew up with uh, either you yourself or your parents listening to Limbaugh and the AM radio and things like that, but especially in the 2000s, Limbaugh's shtick was trafficking in outrage. That's what he did. And there is a reason why largely Rush Limbaugh is not someone who we remember now, because outrage is fleeting. It is ephemeral. It's difficult to suture to any moment in time aside from the moment at which it spawns. Now, I'm not saying that people listen to Rush Limbaugh and they think to themselves, this is how I will understand politics. Or they listen to some sort of left-wing equivalence of Rush Limbaugh. Maybe a dirtbag podcast, something like Chapo Trap House or Red Scare. I'm not saying that that's the only way that people understand politics, right? But if you are consuming political journalism and you're consuming political commentary, there is an inevitable bleed. And that bleed has actually happened intentionally across different news networks. Marcus Pryor, uh, who's, I think he's at Harvard right now, makes an argument in a book called Post-Broadcast Democracy that the proliferation of 24-hour news networks, it actually did lead to this rise in treating politics as a form of entertainment. Now, I listen, if you want to watch CNN nine hours a day and that is entertaining for you, I'm not going to stop you. Like, that's fine. Everyone can do whatever they want. But the issue becomes, if you consume enough of it, over and over and over again, there begins to be a blur between political commentary, what Van Jones and Rick Santorum and S.E. Cup and all of the, the CNN commentators are saying and thinking about versus what Jake Tapper is reporting. And there are some networks that almost intentionally blend the two. I'm not saying that somebody gave Rush Limbaugh a, like, primetime news hour, although Fox very much did give Glenn Beck, who was kind of a younger Rush Limbaugh, a primetime news hour in some way. It's much more that when we allow outrage and political entertainment to have an outsized influence on parts of the electorate, we're naturally going to get to a polarized state. Because if all of the outrage is, look at what the red team did today, that's news, yes. But it's also news through the prism of, God, these guys over here, what are they doing? That kind of thing. And that suddenly is going to filter through all of your other perceptions. I would also argue that politics is increasingly indexed to our personal morality. This has always been a thing. I'm not going to say that politics are never moral, but specifically in the last 10 years, we've had broader conversations about how particular policies that are being implemented or advocated very much are striking at the core of what it means to be an American or what it means to be human. There are times where policies are being implemented that do genuinely have really significant moral implications. There are policies that have been implemented in the last 10 years that people literally have lost sleep over. That's kind of, in a sense, a justification for affective polarization. Because if you're a member of the red team and you feel like the blue team is implementing policies that make it so that your way of life is impossible or fundamentally like reject a moral code that is central to you and like their legislation is unable to fit within that, I don't understand where you're supposed to go aside from affective polarization. Because at some point, it's hard not to think, yeah, those are the bad guys. There are also moments where there are genuinely polarizing candidates. 
I'm thinking about the 2016 election. And I'm not, it would be tempting, I think, for people to think, oh, yeah, he's talking about Trump. And although, in a sense, I am, Trump was an anomaly. He was very different as a politician. And as such, he elicited stronger reactions because our original political heuristics, how we expect a politician to act, they didn't apply. So we ended up having to use other standards. Clinton herself was also quite a polarizing figure. The amount of folks who displayed vitriol, or for that matter, almost un, like adoration towards Clinton, was significantly higher than most politicians. People in 2004 did not fawn over John Kerry, understandably. Uh, however, fawning, political celebrity, that is very much a thing anymore. And as it turns out, when we allow politicians to be celebrities, when we think about them in that way, we allow for the same kind of base moralizing that sometimes we do when we think about a reality star or a celebrity engaged in malfeasance or bad behavior. We can judge them from afar. When politicians do that, it becomes pretty easy for us to get into this moment of affective polarization. Now, why would precisely would this make argument harder? Why would this make our lives significantly more difficult? At least four reasons. First, affective polarization gives us an imagined other. You can't dislike the blue team, you can't dislike the red team without imagining what the blue or the red team looks like. I don't know how you all have voted. I don't care. I'm not asking you to volunteer this information. However, if somebody says, yes, I voted for Bashir in 2023 or something like that, you can actually use that information to make a whole bunch of assumptions about them. I'm not saying that that's what you should do, but I'm saying that that's what we can do in a world of affective polarization. That obviously is a false flag. It's a bad start, right? Because the assumptions that we're making are almost certainly erroneous. Like they're, they're almost certainly wrong in some capacity. But it's also a problem because you're making it so that that person fits neatly into a box. And within that box, sometimes we're more than willing to up the temperature of the discussion. Because if somebody voted for Daniel Cameron in 2023, maybe you have opinions about reproductive rights in Kentucky. It would be understandable if somebody voted for Cameron that you would come in hot on that conversation. And the converse would also be true. If you are particularly passionate about the cause of abortion and you look at Bashir and Bashir's administration and the nature of Cameron's race, it would be understandable that the temperature would be high given how... Yes, contentious the issue is, but also how deep-seated within our morals it uh, has a tendency to be. I would also argue that affective polarization encourages us to import morals onto people. It makes us think not, this person is making a vote out of their own self-interest, or I'm sure that they have a justifiable reason for the vote that they have, but instead, they are doing this vote because of that notion is again, very, very damaging. Because it presupposes that somebody is making a decision, a decision that matters, and giving them a reason to have made it that very likely is not accurate. And then finally, this is probably something that most people have encountered, affective polarization actually structures, in some ways, our media preferences. We consume media that is consonant with our beliefs, not excuse me, not because we don't want to be wrong or something like that, but instead because very often affective polarization and the like cultivation of community, that feels good. If you're a member of the red team, you're gonna consume me red media. And that's largely because that red media is essentially confirming that view of the in-group that you have. And this is true for both sides, obviously. That, though, can create problems because there are left and right wing disinformation sources that traffic in political partisanship. I'm thinking of Occupy Democrats, for example, which is a very, very prone to misinformation. This is not what I would characterize as a legitimate news source in many different ways. Uh, and one of the reasons that people may pursue it is not because they want to consume misinformation or they want to only be told the things that they like, but because Occupy Democrats is able to rally around affective polarization and say, look at what these other guys are doing. We're, we got your back. We're in your corner, those kinds of things.
Affective polarization is a significant problem. And frankly, we'll talk more about this at the end, I think one of the things that we can do is just attempt to turn down the temperature and begin to actually interrogate why somebody does the thing that they do. If somebody voted for Biden in 20, and that is like beyond the pale for you, you feel like that is inconceivable. Is it because they are, I don't, I don't know what you would even label them, a globalist pedophile or something along those lines? Like, I don't know what the affective polarized version of that necessarily would be, but instead of immediately jumping to the conclusion, they have voted this way because asking what led you to vote this way? There were very good friends that I had in 2016 who made vote choices that I disagreed with. And some of them, when I asked them, why did you do this? They had a relatively coherent, like logical explanation for why they did that thing. And if I made assumptions about them, that would have stymied the conversation. But given that I had that information, we were then able to kind of move forward. Go ahead. I have a question about the community aspect. Please. Because I, I think that's really this thing. And I'm wondering if the epidemic of loneliness mm. actually be like in a kind of Africa song. This is a graph of the epidemic of loneliness in this way and then the polarization of the of this kind of the electorate, of yeah. Yeah, like would there be like a like an inverse relationship between those two because this because the, as we need more communities because mm -hmm. we're, we're more lonely those communities are actually dividing us. Yeah. Let's, so uh, a guy named Robert Putnam wrote a book called Bowling Alone. And the thesis of his argument was that in the 1980s and 1990s, American society started losing third places. It started losing places that were not work and not home where you could actually generate community. You have people who are essentially exiting the church and not coming back. You have people who are losing extracurricular activities, things like bowling leagues. That was kind of the animating obvious metaphor for Putnam, bowling alone. Uh, but you also have moments in which public spaces are increasingly being shuttered in some capacity. Heck, the city of Louisville made a decision pre-pandemic to close down many of its public pools. Conversations about austerity, these actually dovetail with this conversation on loneliness because increasingly Americans are atomized. It's uncommon that we have an event like this where this many people are together. And part of that has to do with the pandemic, to be sure. But this is also the kind of thing that increasingly is less and less common. We also do know that even when we do have events like this, there's not actually a lot of crosstalk. There aren't a lot of folks who are actually generating community as a consequence of it. Uh, and although not all community is good, like white supremacist communities are obviously bad, being intensely polarized is obviously bad, you can see the appeal specifically to these online groups. Because if you're able to get a sense of community, a sense of self, a sense of friendship from an external source like a political group on Facebook, you're probably going to gravitate that direction if you don't have any other alternatives. Because we are fundamentally social creatures in so many different ways. That's a great question. And I think that it is one of the many contributory elements to affective polarization. But it's not just that we dislike each other. It's also that we perceive a massive gulf between the policies that we believe can be implemented. That's what political scientists called ideological polarization. Ideological polarization is essentially the distance between policies. So let's use a totally safe example in the form of abortion uh, and think like, okay, you could, there is middle ground, right? Folks like Nikki Haley are trying to make that argument about, well, 15 weeks constitutes the middle ground. Based on the trimester framework of Roe and enshrined in Casey before it was overturned in Dobbs, uh, the middle point was like the, the third trimester, the second trimester, somewhere in there. Like there was essentially some version of compromise. If you were to only listen to politicians talk about abortion, there are people who want individuals to be able to secure that procedure nine times a day, and there are individuals who will never allow it in any other circumstance. Although those gulfs do exist, they are actually less severe than we anticipate them existing. By example, so 
a majority of Democrats, as well as four in 10 Republicans, support banning high-capacity ammunition magazines and creating a federal database to track gun sales. That's a lot of people. A majority of Democrats, plus shy of a majority of Republicans, that's a whole heck of a lot of people and politicians. Nearly as many Republicans support banning assault-style weapons. But, and here's the rub, only 18% of Republicans and Republican leaners feel gun violence is a major problem versus 73% of Democrats and Democratic leaners. This is an instance where we're not actually disagreeing. Like, there is clearly disagreement, but we're not fundamentally disagreeing with each other. We're merely having difficulty actually assessing the importance or the mechanism, essentially what we should do about it, and at what urgency should we do something about it. Now, the problem that we see with ideological polarization is that this kind of issue, where Democrats and Republicans are actually relatively close to each other, this occurs over and over and over again on a lot of different issues. But American politicians are not that way. There's a book in 2006 from McCarty, Poole, and Rosenthal that made the argument that American politicians were more divided on ideology than at any other time in American history since the Civil War. That's not great. Uh, and that's also 20 years ago. Let's not pretend that things have gotten better since then. Just because Americans are able to agree about things, uh, there are always conversations about how 75% of Americans or some overwhelming majority actually privilege or prioritize this common sense solution. Politicians are not getting there. The notion that politicians, that elites are polarized, that can somehow have a trickle, that can sometimes have a trickle down effect. And it can make us think because nothing is getting done. And that's not in your head, by the way. The last like four Congresses have been amongst the least productive in American history, productive as measured by the amount of legislation that they've passed. Like, it's not in your head. Stuff is not getting done. That's actually a reflection of ideological polarization. So the question becomes, well, how did we get here? The answer is very complicated, actually. Affective polarization, I feel like I can push, point at Rush Limbaugh and be like, that's him, officer. That's the man. Uh, whereas when we think about ideological polarization, there's a bunch of different explanations. One of them is the sorting hypothesis, that there are moments where people's votes actually don't make sense. I'm thinking, for example, about the notion of like, yeah, I'm a socially conservative Democrat. I don't know what those words mean, but I don't think that they mean what you think they mean, at least in the current configuration of politics. That did make sense in the 1980s. And as such, as people have actually seen political parties sort of coalesce around somewhat like philosophically coherent issue positions, people are going to naturally gravitate towards those parties. That makes sense. That's the sorting hypothesis. There are also moments where structures encourage us to actually have these kinds of circumstances. Gerrymandering, for example, where districts are carved up in ways that appear to defy reason in order partially to create safe districts for folks. That allows a form of polarization. Because if you know that your district is reliably Democrat, it is improbable that a Republican is going to get into it, you're only ever going to face a primary challenger. How does a Democrat differentiate themselves from another Democrat? Polarization, in a sense. They're able to radicalize. They make the argument, all right, well, yes, okay, this person is a Democrat, and they have these policy positions, but I am if you'll excuse the phrase, more Democrat, uh, because I have these positions. Gerrymandering, things like there only being a two-party system, third-party candidates being imminently not viable in the United States. That's structural. That's not me pontificating necessarily. Uh, and also things like incumbency bias lead to moments in which American politicians are, of course, going to be more polarized. And finally, I would argue that there are actually significant policy differences that we have. Uh, 2000 was an election that was like kind of the beginning of my political consciousness in a way. And it was the Pepsi Coke election. Like there, there were not, there were obviously significant differences between Al Gore and George Bush, but that's not how the campaigns were run. They were talking about what to do with a surplus and whether or not social security was going to get funded. These are not massively contentious issues. They are, but not in the public mind. Now, it's culture wars. Uh, 
It's conversations that conceivably impact our very being, our very soul as a nation. And as such, ideological polarization is logical because you're being presented with two options that are starkly different. Now, if we are largely agreeing, one sec, if we are largely in agreement about a lot of policies, and it's just a question of haggling it out, but politicians are not, we need to ask ourselves how that ought to impact argument. You had a question. Yeah, I just had a question. Please. Yeah, impact, you've already mentioned this kind of, a, the impact of um, the, the media on these, um, how, how the mirror of the media has kind of it's like light hitting a mirror and it's just amplified by it. Like the, the polarization that is already in place is, is actually made worse by the media. In many ways, that can be the case. I don't want to like, I don't want to paint with too broad a brush, right? But like mediated sources of political news are our major way of understanding the world. I'm at the University of Louisville. We have the Mitch McConnell and Elaine Cho archives. Like Mitch McConnell is around. You could encounter him. I have never encountered a wild Mitch McConnell. Uh, and as such, my understanding of Senator McConnell is filtered. It's filtered through mediated lenses. And that may mean that I understand him and the Republican Party and what it means to be a leader in the Republican Party through a lens that may be productive or it may feed into outrage or something along those lines. Media when we talk about it as like this big mass noun, is really difficult to disaggregate because not all media is created equal. However, we can say that the political news ecosystem in the United States is very often not conducive to actually like finding middle ground or understanding where there is room for play. My dislike, for example, of CNN is that CNN has a conflict bias. And what I mean by that is that very often they frame their reporting in terms of one side versus another or multiple sides or something like that. It's honestly it kind of comes down to that if it bleeds, it leads deal, right? So not only do we have to contend with that, we also have to contend with the trickle down from elites. That creates problems for us. Because we make assumptions, again, about how individuals uh, look at ideological polarization and why they may be divided on a policy. Citizens may be told that the other side wants to do something, which may be true of the elites, but it may not be true of voters. There are, for example, politicians in the United States who are very interested in making it so that no abortion is conducted in the United States. Like, th that's not me making it up. There are politicians who are on the record saying those things. I don't think that the average person who voted for them actually holds that idea. And survey data would suggest they don't. That's not the way that it works. But if I'm only getting an understanding of the opposing political party through mediated channels, and that might mean through a conversation about specific outliers of political elites, I'm going to start making assumptions about the other side. And that's going to prevent us from engaging in a good faith argument. Oftentimes also politicians and journalists actually insist that we ought to view a particular issue in a particular way. I'm thinking of these bills about education, which are somehow not about curriculum. They're instead about like the possible like sexual abuse of minors or the possibility of excluding different like non-heterosexual ontologies from school systems. Like in a way, everybody's right and everybody is wrong. But when we have a broader narrative that comes from mediated sources that says this is the way we ought to understand the debate, we can't break out of it in any meaningful way. And finally, very often, people have quite different understandings of economic troubles, of political issues, of social issues, and that difference, it actually requires interrogation. Because not every person who believes that abortion is something that should be available uh, believes that because they themselves would get the procedure or something along those lines. But if you make an assumption about the nature of their position, you're doing yourself a disservice in terms of how you would engage them and have a conversation about, well, why do they feel that way? And is there actually room for compromise or room for them to change their mind? Ideological polarization, in short, creates problems. The final bit of this, which in a way stems from 
affective and ideological polarization is conspiracy theories. America as a country loves us a conspiracy theory. Like, we, have, we got a lot of them. 47% uh, of Americans, according to a YouGov poll, believe that Lee Harvey Oswald did not act alone in assassinating GF, JFK. 29%, there is a deep state working against U.S. President Donald Trump and his supporters. 23% uh, believe that 9-11 was an inside job. These are conspiracy theories. Died in the wool. We know that to be the case. And why would we be talking about them in the context of argument? Well, it's largely because conspiracy theories have been smuggled into components of broader political discourse. Fringe media sources, individuals like Alex Jones, uh, those folks very often contribute to or have a trickle-down effect in their own media ecosystem. And it gets, in a sense, laundered from one position into another. We also see this in anti-vaccine discourse, which I regret to inform you, does have elements of conspiracy theories to it in terms of how those things tend to function. There are also moments in which social channels, things like YouTube and Facebook, actually allow for not only the frictionless spread of conspiracy theories. You can easily see something, hit share, hit like, and other people will be able to see it and do the same thing. But there are also moments in which individuals, because of an algorithm from something like YouTube, are going to be propelled down the rabbit hole. If you watch a video about why the Earth is flat and it's just asking questions, it's possible that three hours later you're you're deep in you're deep into flat Earth YouTube at that point, and that's by design. YouTube is acting as designed in that context, not because everybody at YouTube believes in flat Earth, but everybody at YouTube is under the impression that if you like something, you'd like to see more of it. Now, this seems out of place. Why would I be talking about conspiracy theories when we've previously talked about things like affective and ideological polarization? Well, the answer is that the way that we construct and the way that we understand politics sometimes encourages us to view evidence in bad ways. Conspiracy can alter an argumentative playing field because of base level assumptions and what we would consider acceptable evidence. Anti-vaccine discourse, for example, is self-insulating because if all of your sources are coming from the American Medical Association or the FDA, those individuals are implicated by the nature of the conspiracy. Put simply, an argument with a conspiracy theory is profoundly difficult. It's not impossible, but it is not the way that you would imagine it needing to go. Because appealing to what to you are facts may not actually get there. I would also argue that conspiracy theories tend to warp our priorities, and they warp our media consumption in ways that tend to spiral out of control. Getting somebody out of, for example, the QAnon sort of death spiral before they're deep into it, that's really the way to get them out. I don't know, based on my reading, of ways to extract someone who has been very firmly in the conspiracy rabbit hole for a very long time. And very often, conspiracies like QAnon, they intersect with politics explicitly and directly. And that intersection clearly creates problems for us. So... And it's, I actually put a joke originally in this that I was just going to be like, okay, so y'all figure it out and then just leave. Um, <laughs> but no, in all sincerity, there are actually things that we can be doing on like an interpersonal level to begin to push back and to begin to think about how we can solve this particular issue. So every single class... We're going to isolate some strategies that actually could interact with some of the problems that we've isolated here. Uh, there will be specific references to maybe things that we previously talked about, like affective polarization, and this will occur at the end of every class. But I will tell you, there is not a cure-all. There is not a way to win, win friends and influence people. I study argument for a living. I really, really like this stuff. I do not win every argument that I make. Um, and part of that is because sometimes I can be wrong. And other times it's because this is difficult. There are idiosyncrasies. There are small details that sometimes keep us from being our best selves and being the most effective that we can. But that doesn't mean that some of these strategies are not worth employing. And finally, I would implore you to remember that not everything is actually solvable with an argument. There are going to be moments in which you can make the best faith effort to reach someone. You can do all of the things that we've talked about 
and it's still not going to get there. That is disheartening and frustrating, to say the least. But it's also something that we need to keep in mind, that there is not a silver bullet. And as such, we ought to be circumspect about our capacity to influence others. So a couple of things based on our conversations today that I think would be effective strategies that would be worth thinking about. These are base level strategies. This is stuff that if you did not come to any of the other three classes, I think would still be incredibly helpful, incredibly useful. And first is arguably the most controversial one. Objectivity is a goal. It's not a state. I don't know if you think that you are objective or you think that you are the rational one when you are arguing, but I would ask you to disabuse yourself of that notion because pure objectivity, and this, this is me as a social scientist, like saying these things, when you get a biologist in here, maybe they'll say something differently, but objectivity is not possible. We cannot put on our blinders, exclude all manner of our experiences, all manner of where we are and our commitments and those kinds of things just for the sake of argument. As a matter of fact, Nancy Fraser took to task argument theorists like Jürgen Habermas who suggested that that's what the ideal was. Habermas said the ideal public sphere is people who set aside their interests and come together in the broader common interest. They were essentially arguing for the greater good. And Fraser's argument is that's that's not going to happen, and that never did happen. Like, that's not a thing that we have ever actually been capable of. And as such, when you are engaged in an argument with someone, and you feel as though they are not engaging in what you would characterize as rational, deliberative, logical, objective thought, I would ask you to take a step back. And I would ask you to think what precisely about what they're saying is illogical. Because Frankly, there's probably an internal logic to it. There's a reason conspiracy theories are so hard to argue with. It's because they actually make sense if you're firmly ensconced in them. There's a lot of work that goes into the justification for why somebody holds a particular position that they do. And to dismiss it as simply illogical, because you yourself are the paragon of objectivity, that's, it's not a winning strategy. But that doesn't mean that we shouldn't strive to attempt to be objective, or at least to bracket our own interests that would otherwise dilute an argument encounter. If you have a self-interest in a moment, in an argument, it actually makes sense to put it above board and to say, this is obviously one reason why I would advocate for this, but if we set that aside, here's why I think it would still be defensible. That's acknowledging the fact that you are not objective in the traditional sense. But it's also attempting to contain your particular biases in such a way that the argument is intelligible to other people. At the bottom, the reason why we implore people to be objective is because we're under the impression that if someone is objective, we can agree with them. They're saying things that make logical sense. They're saying things which follow. That objectivity, that dispassionate observer status, is something that we can strive for, but it's not something that should actually get in the way of an otherwise productive argument. Second, the more assumptions you make in an argumentative setting, normally the worse off you're going to be. I'm not saying that you should engage a person who is a noted white supremacist and just like allow that to exit your mind. <laughs> like that, that's, that's very much not what I'm saying here. But when you're engaging a uh, what, what social scientists would call a weak tie, an acquaintance, uh, somebody who maybe doesn't raise to like the friend level, but somebody who is nevertheless in your orbit, in your sphere, and they mention something, something that you would logically want to have a conversation that verges on an argument about, I would encourage you, rather than making assumptions about what that person believes or why that person might believe them, ask them to elaborate. If somebody says, I'm going to vote this way, or I really dislike this particular policy or this particular politician, they probably have a reason. Most people are smart. Like, and it's not even a question of smart. Most people like to defend what it is they 
have thought, right? Like our own thoughts, we get a little bit uncomfortable if we feel like they're not fundamentally justifiable or if they crumble under some form of introspection. As such, many folks have developed ideas and you can invite them to share them with you. Because if somebody says, I'm voting for this politician for this reason, it's well within the realm of possibility that based off of the information that they've gained, that they've gathered, that is correct. But based off of the information that you have, that may not be the case. Because let's not pretend that politicians are exactly forthcoming. They very often will be a little bit slippery in terms of the way that they define things. And that can lead to genuine confusion. And oftentimes, because we don't tend to tolerate confusion very well, that will encourage somebody to make a decision. And it's possible that that decision was erroneous, and that would be the entry point for the argument. Not, you're wrong to vote for this person because X, Y, Z different reasons, but instead, hey, the reason that you're supporting them, that's interesting, I'm not actually sure that that's the reason that you should support that politician or something along those lines. That is a way to combat the nature of assumptions. Because, yes, obviously, if you're a member of the red team and your neighbor's a member of the blue team, you could very easily be antagonistic towards each other. The fodder is there. However, a person does not casually become a member of these teams with like heavy investment in it. They had a reason. And interrogating that reason and asking about it, that's actually a way to generate not only consensus, not only compromise, but also at times genuine change. Third, not everyone is actually worth your time. Friend, I'm sorry, I know that this is a class about arguments, but at the bottom, there are some people who you should not argue with. And I'm not like giving you categories of people, but I am saying that if somebody demonstrably, repeatedly engages in bad faith, argument is not actually a mechanism to allay that person's concerns. There are other ways that you can engage that person, but argument is not one of them. Because if that person is not going to engage you in good faith, if they're not gonna do what we called at the beginning of this session, productive argument, you ought to protect yourself, shield yourself a little bit. Because if you remember the Steven Crowder example, there are some people who are seeking fame by standing on your neck. And I don't think you should engage them if you can avoid it. Now, does this mean that at every single argumentative encounter, your first thought should be, is this person worth my time? No, I do not think you should do that. I think instead you should trust that the people who you are engaging actually have good faith intentions until they demonstrate to you that they don't. Until they give you reason to believe that they're acting in bad faith, you should probably presume that they're trying to engage you in good faith. And part of that comes back to that notion of wouldn't you hope that they're assuming that of you as well? Like, if you're actually genuinely trying to engage in good faith, you would hope that people would see that. You would hope that people would think, this is the kind of person who, yes, I'm willing to have an argument with. And finally, you're not actually entitled to your own opinion, in my opinion. Uh, and what I mean by that is that there are stances that we hold that have not been meaningfully interrogated in some ways. Everybody has them. It's because we are all exhausted and there is not time to learn about everything and every decision that we need to make. However, if your first response when somebody offers pushback on a viewpoint that you have is to say that you're entitled to your opinion, I would encourage you to not do that. Because frankly, you're not. You're entitled to what you can defend. Because if there are two people and one of them creates a position and says, this is what I believe should happen. Here are the reasons. Here is the evidence. Here is all of the things that you would need to make an informed decision. And then another person says, I believe that we should do the opposite. Here's a little bit of a justification. And then when you push back on them, they say, no, 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 you, you don't get to push back meaningfully. This is my opinion. And that's where the conversation is going to end. That's, that can't be productive argument, definitionally. You cannot move forward from that position. Now, I'm not saying that you should question everything, and I'm not saying that you all are wrong in your opinions. It's more that we need to disabuse ourselves of the notion that we are islands and we are able to 
always be right about particular things. At the bottom, this class is fundamentally about acknowledging that, yes, there's a bunch of structural forces that are attempting to convince us that we are right. Because if you're a member of the blue team, you're pretty convinced that the blue team is right. And you have a bunch of reasons to believe that. But that doesn't mean that every single thing that the blue team does is a good idea. And to be able to advocate for those things without actually knowing why you would advocate for them, aside from, uh, yeah, it's the blue team. <laughs> blue team's advocating, so I'm a, I'm a member of the blue team. Blue no matter who kind of thing. That's going to create a set of problems. Because in this context, thinking that you are entitled to your own opinion is a mechanism of sidestepping the argument. Now, many of these things are about us. They're about things that you internally, you individually can do. And the reason that I would encourage you to begin from that point is, and I say this with love and adoration for you all, you probably have some tendencies that are not conducive to good argument. Like, we, we all have those things. We are all going to be defensive. We're all going to have viewpoints that maybe we haven't interrogated, and that's embarrassing, right? Argument actually requires vulnerability. If you are thinking about, well, when I engage this person, are they willing to change their mind? That's a good question. Are you? I mean, like, if they actually present arguments that are compelling, do you think you can navigate to a space that says, yeah, I would change my mind? I'm not saying that you have to change your mind, nor am I saying that only, the only arguments that are productive are the ones that involve somebody fundamentally altering their belief structure. But I am saying that that little willingness to admit that we are wrong, that actually cuts against all of the structural factors that I've isolated. Because if you're able to admit, I could be wrong here, that cuts against affective polarization, which tells you that you're right because you're part of the in-group. It cuts against ideological polarization because it presupposes that there are not just two ways to adopt policies. There's actually a whole bunch of different ways. And it cuts against conspiracy theories because the way that conspiracy theories continue to spread is by removing doubt. There is a cherry picking of evidence. There are self-sealing moments in these media ecosystems. Essentially, there are things that make it so being convinced that you're wrong is a f not something that is going to routinely occur. And as such, I would encourage you to adopt that humility. I would also encourage you to not think that you can control other folks. Now, you can set parameters of engagement. Like, frankly, we've all probably done that. And if you haven't, I would encourage you to do it. Because if there's a person who, when they engage you, they're doing some things. Uh, 743, everyone, just so you know. Um, <laughs> uh, but uh, there are moments in which... Sorry, lost the thread. We're getting there. Um, yes, there are moments in which our engagement may actually have to do with that same humility. But that humility, no, we were talking about actually uh, the engagement, sorry. So when we're talking about trying to work with, um, <laughs> it's okay, I understand, you're good. Oh, no, that's fine. All right. <laughs> you know, he could come next time. Uh, there are moments in which we can set the parameters of how other people engage us. I have a four-year-old daughter, as I previously mentioned, and there are some times where she's, she's just doing normal four-year-old things, and she may raise her voice or use unkind words, and the solution to that is to be on her level and to say, hey, that's not actually how we talk to friends, or I really, I really need you to not use that voice right now, and instead we could be doing this. Now, I'm not saying that you should treat your conversation partner like a literal toddler. Uh, I am, however, saying that if someone engages you and they are doing something that is not actually conducive to productive argument, if they're trying to shift the topic, if they're engaged in, say, an ad hom attack where they're, like, trying to indict your character or something along those lines, you don't have to let that be the end of the argumentative encounter. You can actually set up in that moment a little bit of a firewall. You can take a step back and say, hey... I think the temperatures may be getting raised, and I would love to continue this conversation, 
but here maybe can, is a way that we can think through what that conversation can look like. That moment of taking a coda, just briefly pausing a conversation to check in with folks, that's a very effective way to maintain arguments. Because at the bottom, a lot of arguments interpersonally dissolve because people feel like they are not being heard. And frankly, that happens in a mediated context as well. That prior example of a Facebook post, you don't know if somebody's actually reading the Facebook post, unless they directly engage you, right? And it's possible that that's not a good forum for a debate or for an argument because you can't exercise any degree of control over how someone else engages you. Part of productive argument has to do with looking inwards. It has to do with humility. It has to do with adopting a slightly different frame of mind to how we would approach an, uh, an occurrence. But at other times, it's actually about setting boundaries and saying, these are the parameters of the conversation that I would like to have. And if those parameters are unacceptable to you, first, there's the door. But second, and more importantly, why? What is it about these parameters that are so unacceptable to you? Because frankly, sometimes when we attempt to set genuine good faith standards, they actually do benefit everybody. And very often when folks push back on them, there can be a reason why. Yes. I just, maybe I'm the only one who doesn't quite get it, but is there a way to tell when someone is not interested in a good faith conversation but has a bad faith? Are there indicators either to your, you know, even about yourself? Right. That maybe you're not willing to engage in a good faith. So the first conversation, perhaps, is what's the goal? What's the goal of the engagement, right? Because if your goal is to resolve a particular concern, it's to navigate to some form of adequate resolution of maybe like a work problem, and somebody is actively invested in shifting away from that conversation or diverting, essentially doing everything in their power to stymie a version of that resolution, that's really a good indicator. If folks are more interested in the argument continuing than they are in the cessation and resolution of the argument, that's normally a good indicator that something is going on. Is it bad faith? I don't know. Could be lots of stuff, but it might mean that there is a misalignment of your expectations. There are also times where folks have engaged in the past in particular tendencies, and if they begin to do those things over and over and over again, it's clear that it won't be productive. It's possible, for example, that you have a family member who, when a particular problem is addressed or a kind of genre of issue is addressed, they have the same strategy that they're going to go to over and over and over again. Uh, for example, a conversation about household work, that person will continually double down on, I changed all of the diapers when our children were young, or something along those lines. That, again, may not be bad faith, but it is certainly not conducive to a productive argument. I would say that in a vast majority of instances, the people in your life are probably going to try to engage in good faith. They're just going to be engaged in strategies that may not be conducive to productive argument. Fortunately, Steven Crowder is not a mainstay feature in all of our lives. Like, political pundits are not routinely engaging us. But there are people, especially on Facebook, who it's kind of clear, especially if you look at, like, past posts, this is their jam. This is what they do. They engage, they flame, they abandon the thread. I don't understand why that's a good way you spend your Wednesday night, but if that's how they choose to do it over and over and over again, you do kind of get a sense. That establishment of pattern, I think, is part of it. But we will also talk more about bad faith on next Tuesday, so maybe that can begin to get at the answer to your question. That's a very difficult to answer question in a lot of ways, and as such, it's a good one worth posing. So at this point, we actually, I'm going to pivot to an explanation of what happens in the next three weeks, and then we will take the balance of the time for any outstanding questions. So the balance. In subsequent days, we're going to talk about how to cut against your own worst tendencies and move towards good faith argument. And in doing so, we can identify maybe some tendencies in other people that we would attempt to push back on. Because very often when people are not engaged in productive argument, it's not because they're trying to flip the board over. It's because we don't learn these things. On the 23rd, 
We're going to talk about how to treat emotion in argument, both your own in terms of how to manage it and allow emotion to function as a form of evidence, while at the same time not allowing a disproportionate emotional response, and how to encourage that in others. And then finally, the last class will be how to minimize the impact of social structures. And I'll specifically be talking about uh, racial expectations and gendered expectations in argument, how to minimize the impact and the influence of those things on our conversations. At this point, we have 10 minutes remaining, and I would love to answer any questions that you have. And if not, no problem at all. Here, and actually, I've heard from you already. Do you mind if I kick here first? Go ahead. So we have to ask ourselves, what is the purpose of agreeing to disagree? And I don't mean that as like a rhetorical question. I think that there are moments in which literally giving people space to be heard, that's what matters. Uh, for instance, uh, this is just the most inane of workplace drama. But sometimes in a workplace, if there's a conflict between an employee and a supervisor, sometimes uh, another supervisor, an external supervisor is brought in to hear the employee's concern, even though that employee is entirely in the wrong. They have no reason to have beef with that supervisor. Uh, this is a moment in which the airing of grievances is literally the point. Like, Agreeing to disagree is not fundamentally unsustainable, unless it kind of is, right? Because I think sometimes we take agree to disagree to mean, I don't want to talk about this anymore, but that ignores the moments in which talking about it actually is like a really important thing that we have to do before we can pass go and before we can collect $200. Uh, this is probably not the direction that you were going, but I'm thinking about debates that involve a person's humanity. So... If you, for example, are a trans individual or there is a trans individual in your life and there is another person who is heavily invested in the gender binary and they essentially make the argument that a trans person literally cannot exist, ain't no agreeing to disagree there because that person is under the impression that this person should not exist. That's a problem. We can't just leave that there. Now, I'm not saying that we then need to, like, I there isn't necessarily an adequate resolution between those two people. But that does not mean that we can't eventually get to a space where people can acknowledge, like, coexistence. Because it is well within the realm of possibility that people are living lives that are entirely unintelligible to you. And maybe that's not a problem. Like, as long as you are treating that person not with, like, Midwest nice, but, like, honest-to-God actual respect, like, it's possible that that's what agree to disagree will actually get to. Sorry. Uh, but if it's not, if agree to disagree is just a way to shut down the conversation, that's when it becomes a problem. So the unfortunate thing is I can't give you a bright line. I can't tell you this is when it's acceptable. But honestly, when coexistence, genuine honest-to-God coexistence is possible, that's when agree to disagree is probably fine. Because, like, there are many different religions. I've been told there are at least four. Uh, and as such, uh, like, there have to be, there has to be some degree of coexistence, right? And arguments about, like, religious faith, these are often two ships passing in a night. Because even though there is evidence in religious dogma, like, let's not pretend that there's not, sometimes that evidence is simply not intelligible to the other side in a meaningful way. And yeah, we can agree to disagree in that context unless one person is under the impression that their religion is the right one and conversion matters and all of those things. Like it's those external factors that make it so the other conversation partner is unsafe or untenable in some ways. That's, that's where the problem lies, I think. You had a question and then you had one. So is there any specific way that we can, when going into an interaction, depolarize both ourselves and the person we're talking to? You'd have to know more about that person, I would say. Because, like, 
if you if you engage in like a genuine conversation with someone, and this is again like a, a weak tie, somebody who you know but you don't like know that much about them, the way that you initially begin the conversation that can make sure that the temperature doesn't start that high. It, having a more exploratory or being more willing to listen, those are things that tend to drop. Not polarization per se, but that like that interpersonal tension, that affective element that would make somebody have their heckles raised or be very defensive towards you. That being said, if you th like, we cannot presume that we can actually like evangelize the other side. Like we're we are not going to be able to convince folks who are deeply entrenched in their political beliefs to change those beliefs. Doesn't mean that we can't have productive conversations with them, but it does mean that if somebody has voted for the Republican Party for years and years and years, the probability of you getting them to change their vote is very low. Doesn't mean you shouldn't talk to that person, but it does mean that you should calibrate your expectations, if that makes sense. Does that kind of get at your question a little bit? Yeah. A little, a little bit, I'm trying. Yeah. You had a question back here. Uh, yeah, you put the third spaces earlier. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I hadn't thought about this before, but is there something. Um, uh, uniquely pro-social about the in, in an in-person argument versus, say, social media, which there's no person in front of you computer. Right. Is even if it's a strong argument, person or person, is there something pro-social or pro-humanizing about that versus the social media argument? So I would say yes. And the reason is that there are media scholars, uh, a guy named John Suler did some work looking at what's called toxic disinhibition. Essentially, when people are assholes online, why? Uh, what does that achieve? Not, I'm sorry, not what does it achieve, but why? Why precisely are they being assholes? That's a very good question, and Suler makes the argument that there are specific structural things on Facebook, for example, that would actually encourage you to not treat your conversation partners with respect. Asynchronicity is one of them. You being able to say something, and then you wait for them to say something. We've all had that moment where we had an argument, and then later in the shower, we're like, oh, I could have devastated them. Um, <laughs> <laughs> this is what you get to do on social media. You get to compose the most polished, thoughtful version of your argument, and you would think that that is good. But in reality, that's actually allowing you to kind of lob bombs and then run away. Uh, so in person, it's much harder to do that. Also, at a minimum, it is very, very easy to presume all Democrats or all Republicans are X way until you have somebody in front of you who is that political party that you were demonizing and they are just a regular person. Maybe not great, maybe not bad, but just like a regular person, right? That connection of humanity can be achieved online. I'm not gonna say that like online spaces are inherently bad, but there is something to be said about an in-person event because it does sometimes cut against our worst tendencies. Uh, I would not say, like, arguing online is always going to be a good thing. I would not even say that most of the time it's a good thing. Uh, but there are plenty of moments in which that actually does matter, if only because it allows people to, to vent. It allows them to have their expression and actually navigate almost towards this agree-to-disagree kind of circumstance. I feel like there was another question, and it was over here. Maybe not. Perhaps not. I'm not trying to put you on the spot. Other questions? We have like two minutes, so there can be one more if we want. It seems as though there is not. I really appreciate y'all's time tonight. Thank you so very much, and I hope to see you on subsequent Tuesdays.